What's up, Accelerators? Welcome to Normalize It, the show where we speak about and explore the business of disability inclusion and accessibility. I'm your host, Cam Baudouin, and on each episode, I'll be interviewing leaders, professionals, and people with lived experiences. And we'll be discussing the challenges, successes, and strategies on how to make this world a more inclusive place. As you know, many organizations are still trying to figure out disability inclusion through a trial and error method. That's inefficient. Stick around to the end of the show to find out how we can fix that. So whether you're an advocate, entrepreneur, business owner, stakeholder, VP, or just someone who's interested in the world of disability inclusion, this show is for you. Let's dive into it. Chris, how are you today? I am well, Cam. Chris, I'm so happy to have you on the show. We are tackling or talking about this like really important topic in the world of accessibility. And in fact, just like we were talking a little bit before the show started, it seems like you can't throw a rock without talking or hearing about AI these days, right? Yeah, that's right. Lots of headlines over chat GPT. I know so many people that are playing with that now, using that to do their first drafts of writing or even... Uh ask questions. I talked with a friend the other day. They said they used chat GPT to improve their dating profile. They said they took what they wrote and they said, chat GPT, make this better. You know, what do we need to know as a baseline when we talk about AI? What do we actually mean by AI? Maybe you can kind of give us a, a very high level on, on what we're even talking about when we say AI. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so let's see. We know that, like we were saying, it's creeping into many facets of our lives. We've got recommendation images or recommendation engines like for TV shows and products. Those of us that have used these have had the experience. They're getting better and better. They're really solid at recommending things. Uh, AI is used for fraud detection, say banking transactions, email spam, medical image uh, analysis to help like find uh, early onset cancer, that type of thing. Um, so it's really everywhere. There are some really great applications of special benefit to people with uh, disabilities that we've seen growing. Auto captions, they started off pretty rusty. They're getting better and better all the time. Image recognition, again, earlier versions were pretty rusty, but I think um, we've been seeing that become more and more accurate. There's cool stuff like prosthetics that use AI um, to, to help uh, users direct the prosthetic with their, uh, with their brain signals without going further down the list. Lots of great applications. So one thing I like to try to clarify, up until, say, maybe 20 years ago, um, the computer programming before then was written in a way, um, it's, it's called procedural programming. And this is where humans, human programmers, when we wanted to have computers make decisions, we would write those things out. So in an example of say a spam filter, we might say, if the subject contains free and easy, move to the junk folder, otherwise put it in the, the inbox. We might use this kind of programming to say, write a program to determine if someone's qualified for a loan, but it would be a, a decision tree written by humans. These things were, were great, but once we start looking at things like language processing, image recognition, it becomes too huge for people to sit down and write every contingency. Think about trying to analyze the stock market or something like that. You just can't. It's out of scope. And the bigger these things get, the more bugs they have. In. So the approach opposite to procedural programming is machine learning. And instead of a human sitting down and writing down the logic that the computer follows, we instead give the new AI the goal of figure out objectives and then use big data to say, go through all this and find the patterns um, based on, so uh, to, for a more concrete example, let's revisit spam. We might take a million or a couple million email messages, uh, have some of them flagged as spam and some not, use this as the training set for the AI. And then at the end, the AI is going to be an accurate predictor of what is spam or, or not. And the difference or the issue we have to take into account here is that if there are problems with these procedural programs, say we find, for example, these are biased against uh, people of certain genders or disability types, we can open up these rules, find where the issues are and adjust the logic. Machine learning, when 
the AI is essentially writing its own logic, it's written into a neural network. And what that means, simply put, is it's not human readable. You can't open it up and find where the problem is. You might not even be able to read it. And this is called the black box problem. So when it comes to the issue of discrimination in the, these systems, when they turn out to be problematic, firms have a really hard time figuring out what went wrong and where the problem is and fixing it. And in some cases, entire systems have to be thrown out and started again. And it's just sort of scary because what we've, we've got is higher accuracy in some of these detection systems, but what we've given up is the ability to understand how the computer's doing it. Yeah, I wanna go back for a second because I remember when I was working at IBM and that was when Watson became really popular and they were advertising and saying, Watson is gonna be able to detect cancers, lung cancer. Like they were probably five years before the curve. Their promises were greater than the, what could be delivered at the time. Because in fact, they were not like, they were promising that AI was going to be able to just take a picture and spit out a result saying, likelihood of cancer. And we all probably remember when Watson competed against Kyle, uh, Scott Jennings, uh, Jeopardy. And they took the top players from Jeopardy and put them against AI and, and AI won. Now, no one's, if you watch the, how they made that, I'm not sure if you know, but they had to literally unplug and replug Watson four or five times during the episode. It was not there yet, but I would challenge that now, now we're at the point where, I mean, it, it, there's, there's no competition. We are also talking about general AI, right? General AI, meaning that you can pretty much offer any input and it will generally output something or it'll be able to gather information on it. We've had specific AI for some time now in, in certain areas, but really general AI is what we're talking about here. I also find this really fascinating. When you're talking about big data, what happens if I feed a computer a million images of able-bodied people and say, show me some humans? What happens there? Well, I think you know the answer, Cam. The accuracy of the, the system ends up reflecting whatever data it's uh, been trained on. And this is this is the problem. If that type of data set doesn't include people with disabilities, people of different races or genders or whatever, whatever comes out of the AI when you ask it to generate is going to reflect what went in. So you can think of it this way. If nobody with disabilities is pictured in the data set, the computer doesn't even have the ability to imagine that. This is a problem. I haven't tested this in a, in a while, but I know it's something that that people are aware of and working on. But if you go, I don't know about Google images, but you go to stock art sites and you search for CEO, it's going to be, guess what? Predominantly, you know, old white dudes. And so I know there's, there's the desire to have more diversity in those results. And this is where people, this gets us almost into the conversation of how you correct for it. You need to be very mindful about the data that's going in and be very watchful about the results that are coming out and use whatever uh, feedback tools and manipulation of the data you can to get that result. So there's a term in computing, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And what I find interesting is that this is staying true to AI, even though it's, uh, it's that black box problem. But still, if you're not able to capture at the end of the output and say, that's not correct, right? That's not what we're looking for, because that's what it does, right? We feed the output right back into the input of machine learning and it then you know we we tailor the results of the output and say that's not the human we're looking for that's not the human we're looking for and it pipes in so if the bias it almost sounds like the bias isn't from the machine but it's from the people who are feeding it data yeah so there's two sources of bias what you talked about was considered uh, representation bias um, also known as sampling bias so let's take, and th these are historical examples that I hope have, have been worked on, early digital cameras and early uh, sensors for say like soap dispensers and faucets and bathrooms were trained predominantly with test subjects with white or light skin. And so we had situations, um, I know 10 years ago, again, I'm hoping that these have been realized and corrected for, because I know they made headlines, smartphone cameras would color adjust really wonderfully for white folks, but then would not get the contrast balance on people with dark skin's face. When it comes to these detectors, there were cases where people with dark skin would 
put their hand under the paper towel dispenser and it simply would not pick up that there has been a light change. So this is a case where if you are not testing with diverse sample representing your users, you're going to have that kind of discriminatory problem. But there's another layer that the outcome is the same. This is called historical bias. And this comes up where even if we use real data or representative data from the populations to train the AI, any bias, racism, sexism, ableism from the past will get captured and perpetuated moving forward. So one place this has come up in is training AI to say scan resumes of people and give them a score on their hireability. Um, so there have been systems developed where they were just biased against women. And why is this? Because they're looking at historical hiring data for the past 40 years because of human biases, the people that were hired into organizations and promoted and successful within organizations skewed towards men. So this predictive engine is predicting the same results of the past, making it more important to be very mindful about our intentions of what we want a just and fair outcome to be and how that affects uh, the data. Sounds like a big problem. It sounds like a bigger problem than something that can just be solved, especially by the end user itself. It's not my fault that I was in that I'm in a wheelchair, or it's not my fault that I that I'm blind or have a physical disability, and then I can't scan, I can't use uh, face scan on my phone uh, because of I have maybe a deformity or something on my face. Therefore, it, it doesn't work. That's not my fault. Right. Yet. How do we correct it? How are we even preventing it at that point? Because the people who are being most affected, I remember hearing stories of from friends who were blind who couldn't use face detection. They have to turn off the, um, uh, there's a feature which you have to blink, right? In, in face detection to prevent a photo of yeah. yourself being used to unlock your phone. And people who are blind have to go and intentionally turn that off because many people who are blind either don't open their eyes or, or wear glasses or I don't have no control or have never, you know, things like that don't have eyes so what do we do i mean what do we do to prevent that bias i mean what what's the recommendation that large companies should or could be doing right now to uh to prevent that that's that's a great example um and i have to insert my cop out here that i'm not an ai developer um so i can only go so deep as far as uh solutions and and recommendations but I find a lot of parallels here in the, the high level recommendations of what we use in digital accessibility, which is inclusive thinking all along the development cycle. So these include recommendations of include diversity within your development and project teams as much as possible so that that the diversity is on a top of mind for people working together. Test consciously with a wide range of users, including people with disabilities, people of different uh, races, genders, socioeconomic status. Make sure that at every point in the process, you're thinking about the diversity of the users. Educate people in these teams of the problem, the nature of the problem. So one of the issues is that AI, as it's looking for patterns in this data, it skews towards the average. It's looking for patterns. Just like with digital accessibility, we need to make sure that people understand this isn't a one and done kind of project. It isn't like, I made my website accessible. Cool, we're, we're done with that. We don't have to think about that for another five years. This is something that needs to become part of the, the development culture. And then test, test, test your, your outcomes. Um, so as far as technical techniques, um, I know there's ways to provide human feedback into results. And there's, you can be mindful about the data that you're training on. We talked a little about gender and race. One of the things I like to flag is, is it's even more complex with the group of people with disabilities because we have such a range of diversity just within that group. Like you said, the issue of somebody with facial recognition and blindness or, or facial differences, that might not affect somebody with a movement-related disability at all. The needs of people with cognitive disabilities are different. So we almost need to look at these different disability types specifically and recognize that it doesn't do us too good to lump folks together and say, 
cool, we threw a couple photos of blind folks and folks in wheelchairs in that set of images. Problem solved. It's, it's going to be a little bit more nuanced than that. Because this is something that we're accelerating things in a certain way, coding standards or coding practices. Uh, help me out here. I'm sure maybe you know what's the name of that tool. If anyone who's listening also knows the name of that tool where uh, you can actually get AI to suggest, like in, in VS Code, it'll just suggest like, oh, it looks like you're trying to build a carousel. Here you go. And it just delivers the carousel uh, code for you in HTML. GitHub has one called Copilot, Copilot yeah. I think. And they produced, I saw just the other day, a really cool video of um, a developer. I think he had cerebral palsy or, or um, some other movement-based disability or condition that made typing really challenging for him. And he was talking about how useful this is to him because this co-pilot is doing great at supplying starter code for him and he can spend a lot less physical effort just correcting and tweaking instead of writing out all the code himself. And I think this is kind of the the positive effects of AI, right? And I, I don't think this is something that we're, we should be afraid of personally. I use AI almost every single day. I use ChatGPT almost every single day to start off my 60% when I'm, when I'm writing something. I think it's a, and, and now there's data that shows us that workers who leverage AI properly are able to work more efficiently and faster. And that kind of parallels what you're talking about right now too. So we talked a little about the negatives and, and training data, especially on images and things like that. What else are we considering as some of the biases that are inside our uh, these the systems, uh, regardless of, of images? When we spoke about the biases generally, um, I mean, another issue that comes up, this is, this is related, is that... AI is great in marketing for, say, identifying um, different consumer groups uh, based on their behavior online and marketing to them. One of the concerns I've, I've spoken about before is, and, and if just in case folks aren't aware of this, our behavior online that is, say, tracked on by cookies and different systems is able to come up with, with sort of profiles on us and our user behavior. This is one of the ways in which these recommendation engines are working so well. For example, if you don't turn on privacy controls for some e-commerce sites, not only are they looking at the things you purchased on the site, they're looking at the other sites you visited, what you do on social media, and bringing these things all into, into factors in making recommendations to you. So there is a, a danger. People with disabilities, based on their online behavior, can essentially be outed uh, for having a disability and marketed to. In one case, in the in the, the optimistic case, maybe this is cool where um, this allows somebody to learn about a new piece of assistive technology or something like that. But the danger in marketing is we also have people taking advantage of people's insecurities, taking advantage of people. So think about a different example, but selling uh, body spray and zit cream to teenagers because you've detected that they're feeling um, insecure or unconfident. So the problem is we've got HIPAA, which protects people's disability status in the, in the states from being used in this way, but that only applies to healthcare and healthcare related industries. So there's nothing in the law that protects uh, marketers from doing this kind of thing crunching the big data and, and basically determining if people are, have disabilities. But, but that seems like something that's been around forever. I mean, there's always going to be bad actors and bad players who are going to try to get whatever data they can. They give themselves an edge in marketing or sales, right? Capitalistic society. I mean, we know that Facebook has done that sometimes in our past and has used our data incorrectly or, or immorally in a certain way. This doesn't sound like a new problem is what I'm trying to say. It sounds like this is an old problem with a new tool. And yet there is a, there's a discussion out there that says AI is bad and we should stop all AI. And I don't think I agree with that. I think this is just one more tool that we need to learn how to use uh, ethically and morally and not kind of shy away from. <laughs> That's tough. I, I agree. I mean, part of one of my recommendations is 
for companies, you know, we talked about training and we talked about awareness and testing throughout the pipeline. Again, parallel with digital accessibility, it's important that companies from sort of a high level or top down approach realize that AI ethics and AI inclusion and fairness are important. And there are some companies out there that have done a good job with this. Um, I know Microsoft has public um, responsible AI guidelines. And part of that, when the, the company's official stance is to be ethical, I think is important uh, as a message throughout the company to say to people, this is important. You have the time to do this. We want you to do this, but you got to get that product to market, right? I don't think all AI progress should stop, but I do worry about companies who live or die based on their stock price and being the first one to get that to market can, can make a big difference. So I think within our system, there's pressure there. Um, at least it's on the other side of, of safety. If, if a company says, ooh, well, to make this 100% safe, we're going to have to wait another six months. Oh, wait, what if our competitor launches in the meantime? We're going to lose this opportunity. The point I'm trying to get to is I think we, we don't halt all development, uh, but we do need some sort of regulation or legislation to strengthen the laws to protect people. I don't have full trust in companies to handle this on their own. Very similar to like, you know, whenever they take uh, the, the social media guys up in front of Congress, they're like, oh, don't you don't need to regulate us. We self-regulate. It's cool. Back off. Um, I don't I don't buy it. I think we need some sort of regulation. I've heard ideas. Real harm or danger could be um could be put upon people with the use of ai so there's we talked about recommendation systems right and you know if if it recommends a show to you cam that that you don't really like there's very minimal harm there but we're using ai to make hiring decisions and insurance decisions and financial decisions which could really be life-altering you know and at least in those cases i like the idea of having some sort of requirements put on companies to prove that they've tested and validated uh, the fairness and safety of their AI. So we do this in the States with prescription drugs. You can't just come up with whatever drug and send it to market. You have to do the testing and get approval. Uh, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but there's, there's possible harm here. And I'd like to see something in that direction that's going to make sure these things have been tested and vetted against this bias before they're released to the public. Talking about regulation and what does that even look like for something like AI in the short term and long term? What have you heard so far? Because it sounds like, let's be honest, people don't know how to regulate this right now. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did some research on laws in um in the States and some countries in Europe, and I'm no expert in this, uh, but what I found is is a lot of the talk in, in, in government is about either setting up committees to investigate or putting forth broad guidelines of how companies should produce things ethically. But to me, most of these things looked like guidance but not a lot of anything firm that could really hold companies uh, accountable. The, the strongest legislation I saw, and it hasn't been, it's, it hasn't been fully passed, um, but in Brazil, it's up for debate in their Senate. That's the strongest law I found that actually says, if your AI does harm, your company is liable. And that's, that's the kind of thing I, I think we need. Um, right now, hypothetically, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, we can't have you know, public tools discriminating against people. But it's going to be really hard for anybody to prove that in court. Um, so as far as U.S. law goes, I would love to see something that was more specifically tuned uh, to AI and potential harms there. Because, for example, if, if, if an AI hiring system has, has some type of bias in it and it leads to you not getting a job, for example, I've talked about 
there are interviewing tools that will actually do facial analysis on people's videos to determine if they're confident. And like the example you said earlier, if somebody can't maintain strong eye contact, there's a chance that that might hurt their score in this hiring screen, for example. But how, do, how does somebody who doesn't get a job prove that or, or enforce that? The AI itself is intellectual property owned by the company, and that data isn't public. This gets back to the idea of maybe these companies need to show at least to some sort of government regulator, look, this hiring system, here's, here's the results over different, different groups, um, and we're showing diversity in the tool. Um, that could be one solution. It seems to me like as we're talking here, like all, all, all I can, I can't stop thinking about how the problem is still the human in inside all of these, the human and how the hiring process is already full of bias and adding AI without addressing that bias is, is you know, baking into the process. The human is the bias. And so I'm imagining the naysayers and the people who really go and read uh, maybe not a dystopian future where AI controls our every action and things like that. I mean, that's one angle, which I don't really think will, will come to fruition. I hope not, but I do welcome our AI overloads if any of them are listening. <laughs> but I do want to think about the fact that humans are the ones who are baking in bias and humans are the ones, people are the ones who are creating these inaccessible systems. And whether we have an, an AI tool that builds websites for us or audits our websites for us, it's whether the people behind it, the developers and the people who created it are creating systems and tools that are without bias, which we know bias changes over time and bias changes. You Historically, you mentioned about the historical bias that gets in there. Over time, we change and that becomes better. It, hopefully it improves. It doesn't get to go the other way. Where does that leave us? Where is the future of AI? Like, where does this leave us as the future of AI and people with disabilities, AI and, and discrimination or AI? And uh, where, where does that kind of leave us with everything? Like, uh, is, uh, I, I can't stop thinking that this is a, one more tool and it's the humans that need to fix themselves, not the, not the AI. You know, we spent time and that, that's the purpose. I like to think I, I don't necessarily have detailed solutions here, but I'm kind of trying to wave a warning flag in, in these, these talks. If we want to switch it up and be optimistic, you mentioned inherent human bias as far as the hiring process goes. Designed well, that could help alleviate the bias um, that humans might have as far as race, gender, and disability goes. If the time and attention is put into the data uh, and the outcomes, that can help people see, give people feedback of like, wow, did you realize this was the, the diversity of the people that applied for this job, but you only interviewed this subset. So there is potentially a way that well-designed systems would not have the inherent bias that humans do and could help us see or correct for that. So that's, that's an optimistic way. But again, this is a design question, a data question, and a monitoring outcomes. If we want to make sure we've got uh, diversity in there, that could be built into the, the system. You know, there are some steps being put into place right now, but it always seems like it's a laggard of about five to 10 years. You gave the example of uh, social media in the past. And, you know, I'm not sure if anyone's ever watched that video of uh, Mark Zuckerberg speaking in front of Congress where they, they don't even know the right questions to ask him to be able to have a meaningful conversation about the, the detrimental effects of, of social media on, on kids, right? And things like that. And the concept is just so far removed that we are lagging by, like I said, five, 10 years to, before any kind of regulation gets put into place. Even crypto. Man, I remember seven years ago, where was crypto? And people were just like, now, only now has it been regulated in, or is trying to get regulated in a meaningful way, uh, which has totally destabilized it in certain ways. So I, I don't really think that, you know, regulation is the key. I, I always feel like it's up to our own, like people like you and I and people having conversations here, we need to go and champion again, reminding people to not bring bias into theirs and checking them and being that, being that waving flag, like you mentioned, how do we become better champions on, on removing bias of all types from, from our workplaces, our environments, our culture, our communities and, and such? There's an interesting counter argument I heard. So I'm just repeating, I'm not trying to espouse this against regulation with the idea that if say US, Canada, Western countries puts regulation and, and safety things in place that slow progress, that that's just going to leave firms in China who, ha who ha China has a very strong initiative to encourage AI to get ahead and the 
you know, the example we're looking at is uh, TikTok and TikTok's AI that keeps people engaged by observing which videos you watch and interact with. Hey, Chris, just before we wrap up here, why is this important to you? Why is accessibility important to you? Why does it matter? It's, it's just like with digital accessibility, equity and fairness in the world are, are important to me. Um, I want everybody to have equal access to all the things. I want people to be treated fairly in society. And like I said, as these things roll out more and more, this is going to be a bigger factor. So I'm trying to wave the flag and raise awareness. So hopefully this will be included more and more in, in development efforts and people will be more mindful of the potential dangers. Wasn't that a great episode? You probably have lots of new ideas swirling through your head right now. Now, how are you gonna go and teach that to your boss, your team, or your clients? You need a strategy to move forward. Contact me today, hi at cambodwine.com, and let's talk about how we can move this forward in your organization or individual practice. If you could right now, like and subscribe to this show, it really does help grow our reach to get more people involved and interested in disability inclusion and making the world a more inclusive place. And don't forget, you can also watch this show live on LinkedIn. Just find me there. It's every Friday at noon Eastern. See you next week.